a lovely uh, village in Hampshire and we're here to meet Ashley Moat, the member of the European Parliament for the South East, an independent member. He has his battle bus here today on the car park and he's meeting his constituents, giving them information, advice, just generally jenning them up on stuff that they would never ever know if we didn't tell them because the media doesn't want you to know. So we'll go and see him in a moment and ask him what he has to tell us. He's very, very active in the European Parliament. He has many, many speeches. Um, we'll give you his website during this talk and I do advise you to go and look it up. He even has a book of his speeches. Absolutely brilliant. So let's go over and see him. Ashley, I'm very pleased to meet you and perhaps this morning you could explain to me some things that puzzle me about the European Union. Could you, for instance, tell me um, what uh, about immigration, please? What, do, what does net and zero immigration mean? Well, let's start with immigration itself. We in this country have given away our, uh, the right to control our borders and as a result of that and our membership of the European Union we are now seeing unlimited and large-scale immigration into this country from the whole of the rest of the European Union and in particular from Eastern Europe. And we're talking about many millions of people who now have a right to come and live and work here and there is absolutely nothing we can do about that. And the real problem this country has and it's unique to the European Union is that we are already seriously overcrowded. There is no other country in the EU that faces the same immigration problems on the same scale as Britain. This country has a target ideal population of about 30 million people and we are already well over 60 million. And if you realize that on the roads, for example, if every other car was not there, when you go into a city centre and every other person was not there, you suddenly see how much better this country would be with a population that was closer to the amount of land and facilities that we have uh, and which could we could then properly sustain. At the moment, we are reaching a point of crisis in terms of sheer numbers. We're running out of uh, water in some areas. We're running out of energy in some areas. We're running out of space. Uh, we're beginning to build on land and in congested areas in a way which is changing the nature of our towns and villages. And the total effect is to change the characteristics of this country, its national identity, and its sense of being a single country. We are becoming, and this is a quite deliberate policy of the European Union, we are becoming just another part of the massive European Union and the intention always was to dilute our sense of belonging to an individual nation state. Thank you, Ashley. I believe that uh, five million people have already left Britain and five million people have been allowed to come in. Could you tell me anything about the type of people leaving Britain and the type of people who are coming in? Well, you did ask that question at first, and of course I didn't actually answer it, so thank you for reminding me. The, the, this government, the Blair government, talks about net immigration being very small um, on the grounds that large numbers of people have come in and large numbers have left, as you say. But the point is that we are seeing large numbers of indigenous Brits leaving to go and live in other parts of the world and they are being replaced by people from Eastern Europe, uh, from the Middle East and from Africa and other parts of the world um, and they are able to get into this country because there is no effective control of European Union borders uh, you may, for example, uh, know about the numbers of Africans 
who are coming in through the Canary Islands. They're taking great personal risk uh, and traveling on small boats uh, to the Canaries. But once there, they're technically in Spain and that gives them the freedom to come to the UK. So we're seeing a change in the ethnic mix here of a, on a scale which the world has never seen before. So it's all very well for the government to talk about net immigration being quite small. Um, it's not down to zero. But what they're omitting to mention is that the nature of the population is profoundly changing because the people who are leaving are tend to be Brits and the people who are coming are clearly not. Mm. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. Um, you said quite a lot about uh, what we lose by not being in the European Union. Is there anything else you want to say about that? About, um, you know, that if we go into the European Union, we're going to lose our gold, our pension scheme's going to be in, uh, integrated with theirs. Um, we're going to lose an awful lot, aren't we, by joining the European Union? Well, we are already in the European Union, and yes, we have lost an awful lot already. Um, the whole point, as I was saying earlier, is that the European Union becomes a single state, eventually. And that means we would lose control over our, um, our gold reserves, yes, our currency reserves, our decision to make, de uh, our ability to make decisions about um, interest rates, uh, about taxation, uh, and so on. The ultimate goal of the European Union is a unitary bureaucratic superstate with all the key decisions being made by unelected bureaucrats over whom we would have no direct control whatsoever. Uh, and most of all of course we'd lose the right to govern ourselves wouldn't we which is the most important thing really. Well we've already lost the right to govern ourselves in large areas of uh, public life. We have no control over our agriculture we have no control over our fishing industry, we have no control over our international trade, uh, and so on and so on. Um, again, that process will continue until and unless we leave the European Union altogether and restore our right to govern ourselves and make our own decisions in our own best interests, which is what we did for hundreds of years and did it remarkably well. And I see no good reason whatsoever why we shouldn't do that again. Uh, two countries have already said they do not uh, wish to have the constitution, and now it's been um, it's been decided behind our backs, isn't it? At the moment, they're passing bits of it uh, without our our knowing. Um, can you say something about that? Well, the French and the Dutch threw out the original constitution. And that should have been an end of it. But the European bureaucrats don't like no. They don't understand what the word no means. And now under the German presidency of the European Council, uh, Angela Merkel, the, the Chancellor of Germany, is trying to revive the constitution. Um, and the idea is to force the countries which had either not decided or had decided against uh, to ratify something which would then bring the original document more or less uh, into existence. Now, the problem she's got is that she is already breaking the law in Germany. Um, the German government has, or the German constitutional court has said that Germany should not be seen to be influencing the decisions of other member states. But she is. That is illegal. Um, the original constitution included in it a reference to the fact that it must be ratified within two years. That cannot happen. And therefore, the rest of the text ought to be regarded as null and void. But that's being ignored. Um, I think we've got a, a problem here not just of the Constitution being introduced by the back door, I also think we have a problem of international illegality. What she is doing is unlawful. 
Um, could you tell, tell us uh, how much is being lost to crime and corruption in the European Union? That's an impossible question to answer precisely. What I can say is that we know that only about 7% of the total budget of 100 million, sorry, 100 billion euros a year is only about 7% of it is properly accounted for. Uh, we don't know how much of the rest is properly used because the accounting and auditing systems don't allow us to establish the facts. What we do know is that a significant proportion is not properly accounted for and there has to be inevitably an element of corruption in there. Uh, I would hesitate to put a percentage on it. What I would say is that I believe it to be substantial. Uh, I'd just like to say that I went on holiday to Italy uh, last year and I spoke to an Italian businessman and when I said to him, your um, prices went up 30% when we went into the, the European Union, he said, when we took, of, um, when we took on the, when they took on the Euro, and he said, no, 50%. And that's what would happen here, isn't it, Ashley, if we actually adopted the Euro? Well, the Euro is already crumbling uh, in the Eurozone uh, support for it is is waning away rapidly. They have experienced, as we did with decimalization in the early 70s, a huge increase in the cost of living, precisely the same uh, as we experienced with the decimalization. Um, and there are parts of Europe where this is a serious problem for people who live on fixed incomes. Uh, colleagues of mine in the European Parliament from the Netherlands, for example, tell me about Dutch pensioners who are bordering on the destitute because their pensions have not gone up uh, anything like as much as their cost of living. Uh, again, exactly as we experienced 30 odd years ago. And there are parts of Europe, northern Italy, southern France, and now all over Germany and parts of uh, the Low Countries where local versions of their original currencies are now in circulation and being used as a means of exchange. And if you go into shops, for example, in Belgium uh, and France and elsewhere, you will see now, uh, suddenly, you are getting a price ticket shown in both the original price, whether it's Deutschmarks or Belgian francs or whatever, and in euros. In other words, people are going back to to practicing um, or using their ex their old currencies uh, as a way of measuring the value of things. Right. Well, thank you very much, Ashley. You've explained quite a lot to me, and I hope you keep up the good work in telling the British people and and the world what's happening in the European Union. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. If you want to know more about the European Union and what is actually going on, by all means visit my website, which is www.ashleymote, that's A-S-H-L-E-Y-M-O-T-E, -E, or one word, dot co dot uk. I'm regularly updating it with uh, questions to the Commission, with press releases, articles, and uh, as much background information about the truth of the European Union and the damage it is doing to Britain. Uh, and it is worth a visit on a regular basis. And may I encourage you to uh, come and join the growing numbers of people who regularly take part in the discussions on that website. Thank you.